you. Lord, I just ask that you just bless Pastor Ralph, Father. Take him and use him so that others will hear about yes, your Lord. goodness. Yes, Lord. So that we can know you better. So that we can make you known in all the lands. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Praise the Lord. We are honored to be here. I tell you, uh, when I went on Facebook and seen uh, Freedom in Christ ministry and I saw what was going on here, I said, well, this is my habitat. So I'm in the right place. The reason I say that because when uh, we first started, we opened a home uh, for men. And uh, I took the men to church to the regular church. And I was having complaints about uh, bringing those men in the church, the way they was dressed and things like that. So the pastor called me in the office and uh, he was telling me about it. And he said, uh, uh, those men you got, you bringing spirits in my church. That hurted me so till uh, I went home and I prayed and I asked, uh, I went back to him and I asked him, well, he was my pastor and I asked him, could I just stay at home and uh, just teach them in the home that they are living in and come to eight o'clock? So he said, sure, you know, that'll be good. But I was hurt all the time and I was broken for how the church supposed to be for everybody. And so I prayed and about two weeks later, some people came to the home and they asked, uh, where was I? And I had just left there. So they called me on the phone and they said, uh, Pastor, you better hurry up and get back here. Uh, it's all these people here at this house. So I said, what y'all done did, man? I just left there. And I went back and there was some people there said they heard about what we was trying to do. And they had a church that they wanted us to take over. So I, me at that time, I wasn't really a, uh, called myself a pastor, but I welcomed that. And I said, okay, what it would look like, a church for the unchurch. I wouldn't care if you was a drug addict, prostitute, whatever you were, it was a home for you. And man, it burst it right open. And we began to start getting people in from uh, all walks of life uh, coming in to, uh, into the church. And they was happy to be there because they saw somebody just like them also, the pastor testimony was a 25-year heron act. That was an awesome thing for them to see that it was somebody there wouldn't uh, talk down on them. So anyway, so the ministry started, uh, True Vine Evangelical Outreach Ministry. We have many ministries up under that outreach ministry that go out in the streets. Uh, we have uh, ministries that... Uh, cater to uh, giving food out on every other Tuesday. Uh, we have a, a program called Jobs for Life, which is teaching people how to get a job and how to keep a job, resume writing, uh, computer class, all this stuff here. And it didn't happen at no one time. Now. It just all came together. Because me being uh, coming out of that world, I know what we need. I know many of us, I, as myself, I didn't have the opportunity uh, to do good in school. And so I figured that's what the things it was. But that's not what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk to you about some things that I believe that is going to help us a lot. And I'm so glad that I'm here to share this. It was a part of my life that I had forgotten about. And then uh, one Saturday, uh, first of the month, the Good News Fellowship, which is in Birmingham, uh, bunch of those pastors get together, which is already up here. Uh, they had different churches this morning. And my pastor is Steve, uh, Pastor Steve Longnecker, uh, Bishop Rebel. And so um, one morning we was meeting and he got to talking about uh, spiritual warfare. And he began to start, he said he uh, got this book, uh, was written, it's called Wounds, Lies, Vows, and strongholds. And when he got to explaining that to us, 
I began to start looking at our church, how many people in the church um, has been lied to. We, we, it's some things that we haven't dealt with that is keeping us from going deeper in the Lord. And so I, um, I ordered the book myself and I began to read it. And as I began to read it, I, um, as a, uh, I began to understand the process that I went through to be where I'm at today. Amen. So what happened was, um, I went to this scripture, or uh, is John eight forty four, or we're well, forty three to forty four. You can turn there if you like, or it may be up there, but it's on the program. I seen it on there, and it said. Why do you not understand my speech? This is Jesus talking. Because you are not able to listen to my words. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Wounds, lies, vows, and strongholds. Today, I want to share with you about the lies. We often think that everything is all right when we get into the church and we get born again. And I believe that, for my belief, I believe that everybody in this fallen world has had some type of wound that has affected them. It can be wounds from uh, your family. It can be wounds from friends or relationships that break up in a relationship. And we go on with life without dealing with those things. And at certain times, these things come back to us and it hinders us from being all that we're supposed to be in Christ. And so the thing is, I want to share with you an example of what I'm talking about. I was wounded. My daddy told me that I was never going to amount to be anything. That was the wound. And the wounds, as I said, it comes from the, the world. It comes from people. It comes from family members. It comes from all types of resources or uh, places that, that, that wounds us. And all through life, as he told me that, as a little boy, I bought into the lie that Satan said, you will never amount to be anything. And on top of that, he began to tell me that uh, I was dumb. I was stupid. All of these things, lies that Satan told me because of what my daddy said, had a belief system in me that I will never amount to be anything. As a result of that, my brother always used to make me walk behind him and uh, and just because uh, they thought of what my daddy said, they, that's what they put on me, that curse. And I was wounded as a child. Didn't know what to do, but I went on because what my daddy said, and my daddy didn't even really know me. He would come around every now and then, just the, uh, my mother had to force him to come to take us to town and buy us some things for school. But that's the thing what happened to me. He took me to town to buy some school clothes and the things that he was trying to buy, I didn't like. So when we got home, that's why he put that thing on me saying that I would never mount to be anything. And so years passed, I go to school and I'm sitting up in the classroom, dumb, stupid. That's what the Satan said. So the thing is, I said wounds 
lies. I bought the lie and I made a vow. I'll never do my children like this. Listen to me. I'll never do my children like this. See, there's some wounds in this house right now that Satan has said, and he put a lie on it and said, you may not never be get out of drugs. You may not, you'll never do this. You'll never do that. It's a lie. It's a lie. And so you have made a vow. Somewhere I never let another man hurt me. Or I'll never let another woman hurt me. Those are vows that we make. And the Bible said that it's better not to make a vow than to make one. And we make these things and then they become strongholds in our life. So as I made the vow that I'll never do my children like this. So now I am a people pleaser. I'm trying to please everybody to make them like me. Because he also said, don't nobody want you. You're good for nothing. I went, I, I, I tried to, I got in the band and I became one of the best drummers there in my elementary school because I practiced and I practiced because I wanted people to see that I wasn't what they said I was. But it didn't work. It didn't work. And I kept doing a lot of things, trying to get, pull them to my side, but it never did work. So as I grew older, I joined the United States Army. Got all these wounds, hurt it. And went to basic training and passed basic training. And then I went overseas. I went to Germany. And there when I met a friend, it was called heroin. And I started shooting up heroin. Well, first of all, I started smoking. I mean, I started uh, snorting it. And I snorted it in. Some of the guys said, man, it's better. You wasting money. You ought to just start shooting it, you know, and you'll get all this. Well, I was scared of a needle anyway. But I was in pain. Because you know what? When I was overseas, I would get out in the, in the, uh, uh, for mail call and everybody was receiving mail but me. I never did get no mail from my family. And that also on top of that, that said, well, they for real. Nobody care about me. I'm just in this world by myself. Until I met Harold. And I started shooting heroin, and I forgot about the whole problem in the army. I forgot all of it because it kept my mind from thinking about how my family was treating me. And I went on and it was time to ETS to get out. And I went, uh, went home, came home, and here I am now. I am strung out. I'm going back to Birmingham, Alabama, and how am I make it? And when I got there and I went to looking for drugs and, and found out where they sold heroin at, and, and it wasn't like it was there. It had been stepped on so much where I had to start shooting three and four times much more than what I was doing. Now I done ran out of money. I done ran out of it, sold all of my equipment that I had. The stuff uh, that I had accumulated, making deals overseas. Now I'm stealing. I'm going into the stores and I'm stealing steaks and all kinds of meat, putting it around me to go sell it to get drugs. Because I'm a nobody. I didn't care. I got drunk, drunk wine all the time and drinking wine and a puke up and nothing but wine just come out. Just didn't care anymore because my daddy said I never mount to nothing. My brother didn't like me. He made me walk behind him. My mother and him, they all of them, they were calling me names and stuff. Big nose. All of this stuff. That was in my family. When you're supposed to have love, people watch out and take care of you. But I was dogged out, as you can say. I went on and 
in and out of jail. Man, I remember one night I went to uh, night court and the judge came and I had my files were so high you couldn't even see him behind all the files stacked up there. Because all of this, because of this person, this enemy. A liar. I was just as worse because I lied too. I lied to get what I needed. I always tell the guys at home and the women at home, I say, if you are still lying, then that lets me know you are the father, you, your daddy is saved. Amen. Because if you lie, then he is the father of lies. So you are representing him when you tell a lie. So the thing is, I kept on and I in and out of jail, serving time in jail. I never go to prison, but I served a lot of time in the county jailhouse. As I went on, brother Tony Tarver was a friend of mine, best friend. He came here once and uh, he had got born. God had saved him. And I was downtown and he saw me. I was trying to break in some cars to get a stereo, whatever I could out of there. Anything that I could get to sell. That's just how I came. Homeless? Yes. Nowhere to go. Because one thing about it, when I came home from army, from the army, my mother had gave the apartment to my brother, my youngest brother, and he had got married. So when I knocked on the door, it's his house. So the only thing I could put my bags down. And when I came home, they'd have locked the doors and board the windows up. I couldn't even get in. So I had to go back where I was, uh, which is Southtown Project, where I was born and raised at. Government projects. And I went up there because I had people around there was just like me. He was using drugs, and drinking, and all this stuff here. But as the years passed by, 25. 25 years, wounded, lies, vows, and strongholds. And one night, I went to church, and I was going down there, and I found out how pastors was. They humble hearts, and I found me somebody that I can work on now. I can get what I need because they care so much about people. And I got money from them. I lied and told them my daddy was dead. All this stuff here and just got money drug for drugs. They didn't know. They had no idea what I was doing. And then they found out that I was homeless and they opened up a place for me, a little house, a little shotgun house, we call them. And I moved in there and turned it into a crack house. And heroin. One night I was uh, with Tony, just before he had got saved, I just back up a little bit, and he, uh, Tony had a whole lot of crack that night. And they was in there smoking and I was in the bathroom shooting up. And uh, I ran out. So I went in there where they was and I said, man, let me try that mess y'all got. And I began to start smoking crack. It was cheaper. My stuff was twenty-five dollars, and they stuff was just only ten dollars. So which one did I choose? The ten dollars, because I liked it. It took me a place that I never thought I would be able to go to. I was all right then. I just started buying crack and just getting high all over Birmingham, going to soup kitchens, eating, and come back out and go steal something to get high with. Cause I was lost, y'all. I was totally lost. Back to the church, I went to this little church and they was uh they was like took the like in me and gave me the place to stay and uh I went and uh started working and but the job was just to support my habit. And when I uh I had bought a little car and one night I took the car and I sold it for five hundred dollars worth of dope. Crack. I gave it to the lady. And I went back home and I smoked and I smoked and I smoked until my heart started flooding. 
I took off all my clothes and got into a cold bath uh, of cold water. And I got in there, and it did help a little bit. But when I got out, I was headed back in there to smoke some more, and I fell out. I fell out, and it was a dream that I saw my grave. I was up over the grave, and I was looking down in it. And it was a grave dug neatly. And I was trying to get out. I, I saw myself struggling, trying to clam out of there. And every four corners of the wall that was in down in that hole, I was trying to clam up, but I couldn't get out of it. It was I was I was I was stuck. And I'm down in there and I heard myself in the dream saying, This is my grave. And I woke up. I put on my clothes. I ran out the house. I left the lady there with the drugs and everything. And I went and called my mother and I asked her, could I come home? Would she please let me come home? And just that moment, by all of that, what they had did to me, she said, come on home. And I went home and I, when I got into her house, she followed me everywhere I go because I used to rob her blind. I did. I would go over there and I would steal. I would take money out of her pocketbook. Uh, she would tell my mother couldn't read or write. She would tell me to get some uh, money orders for her, and I would t uh, sign the money order to myself. But that that was the thing. I was calling myself getting back at her for letting them do me like that. Yeah, you all did me bad, so I'm gonna do you bad. So I would, and she would find out about it, and she would call. Uh, I would come on. She said, "Why is you doing me like this?" Why is you doing me like this? But I couldn't help it. I was so strung out that I had no voice. He had the voice. I couldn't understand what Tony was trying to tell me. Because I was, I was just, I was possessed. I was overtaken by the father of lies. He had told me so many lies that I believed what he said, and I believe today in here right now, some lies that he have told you, they're lies and not true. I don't care what situation you may be in today, you have heard a lie. You bought a lie. Because God didn't create you to be a nobody. We are, are in the, he made us in the image of him. But the devil tells us that we are nothing and we are no good and we are nobody. And don't nobody want to fool with you, but that's a lie. And we have to get away from around people who are talking that kind of mess. Because it'll take us places or sometimes minutes to suicide. Because they feel like they're nobody. And I thought that. I thought I never did try to read. It was a lie. I can read. I never did thought I'd be able to get married. But I said in the vow that I'll never do my children like that. And I had two children that I did the way my daddy did me. I made a vow, remember? that I'll never do that to my children. But the vow that I said, I did it. I did it the opposite of what I said I wouldn't do. I did just like he did. I didn't, I didn't take on responsibility because I couldn't take on responsibility because I was strung out. Yes. They didn't want to be around me because they heard so many bad things about their dad. But as years passed and that night I fell out, I went home and uh, when I went there, I didn't have a shirt on or anything. Holes was in my jeans. And my mother, when she opened the door, she said, boy, Satan got you. Now I just come out of this dream. And I ain't know anything about Satan. I, you know, it just it was just something there, you know, just a word. And I believe that's what's wrong with the church, too. We don't talk about our enemy much. 
See, when I was in the in the army, and I went in the army in 1973, we 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 was training for the Vietnam War. And I knew who my enemy was. But many times in the church now, we don't know who our enemy is. And the Bible said we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers. And so we don't even really understand that we are in a spiritual warfare. Yes, we are not fighting against each other. But he would have us fighting against each other. And that's why why the church is like it is today, because every church on every corner uh, 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 talk of uh, doing something different, of uh, not coming together just like he had. He has a a strategy. He has an army that they 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 main target is to get us to keep us from knowing our God. Yes. And when she told me that, I went in the bathroom. And I got on my knees and I said, God, if you real, please help me. I don't know nothing to do. I came out of there and there wasn't no change in nothing. But I did. I said, I did have a change. Because what I did was I remembered that I was a veteran. I had went all this time and had forgot that I was a veteran. I have called all these places to get some help. And everybody was turning me down. And one place I said, this is my last hope here because I don't need to be on the street today because if I get on the street today, I'm going to die. I had planned to rob a guy next door. And that's all I did, rob folk, jack pocketbooks and ran. And what I did was I called this place again and I said, look, if you don't help me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow my brains out right here on this phone and you'll hear it. I didn't have no gun. But I had to get somewhere because I was scared. Mom, I, the, the dream and mama said the devil got me. So now if he got me, I don't heard bad things about it. So I went on and I called the lady back. She said, wait a minute. Don't do that. Please don't. I'm going to send a cab back. She sent the cab with me. I went to Warrior, Alabama. That's about um, 40, maybe about 30 miles from Birmingham. And it drove me down there. And she began to start interviewing me. And she asked, got to the place. She said, are you a veteran? I said, yes. And she said, then you can go to the VA hospital. She called the VA hospital and they came down in an ambulance and got me. It took me there. I was dehydrated. They put all this stuff on me. I stayed there three days in Birmingham and they sent me to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where it is the nut house. I mean, it's VA hospital. It's big old gigantic place there. I went there, but I didn't care. Uh, they put me on a uh, psych ward. I stayed there for three days. They tried to give me some medication, but I heard a still small voice said, don't take the medicine. So when the nurse would give it to me, I would put it in the back of my mouth or up under my tongue, really. And when she leave, I'll spit it out in the toilet. I stayed there three days on the psych ward, and then they brought me out and put me into the, uh, uh, the regular program. When I got into the regular program, it was starting off with uh, uh, natural things, not spiritual things, because my so happened my counselor was a Christian. And so he kept on at me for some reason. I didn't really know at that time. But as I went through the program, and he told me once when I told my story, about how my daddy treated me and then how my family began to treat me the same way. He said, you done bought a lie. He said, that ain't you. And I said, yes, it is. That's what they said. And he began to start sharing with me some of this back then. 
So he said, what I want you to do is I want you to go out, get somewhere by yourself. And I want you to write your daddy a letter, which he is dead. I want you to write him a letter and tell him how you feel the way he treated you. And I went out there and I sat that letter and I sat there and I wrote that letter and I was crying. And, and I mean, just tears all just coming down all on the paper. And he said, and he said, once you write it, I want you to set it aside, burn it up and forget about it. That day, I sat there and I wrote that letter and God showed me in that letter that I was wounded by him, but I was also lied to. So what I had to do then, I had to confess, I renounced the lie. I renounced that what Satan had told me and then I got free. I was free of that. And then God began to put me on a fast down there in the VA hospital. Here it is. I don't know nothing about Christianity. But I know one thing. Every day I used to go over there to a little church, a little, white, a little small church, and I would get on my knees and I would pray and say, only prayer I knew, please don't let me go back the same way I came. This was every day. And I began to start not wanting no breakfast or not wanting anything. I was just fasting. I didn't know what that was. I just didn't want anything. And as the time came and I was getting ready to depart from there, they told me that I had to write, uh, learn how to write resumes to come out and get a job and things. Now I'm clean 30 days, hadn't had anything. Because all the other time, I was trying to make mama and them feel good. I would go into somewhere and, and, and stay for a few, about a day or two, just to shut their mouth up. But it didn't work. But this time, I went into the library looking for a book. Because there at the VA hospital, we had everything we need. We had, we had, the, uh, we had a bowling alley. We had a movie theater. We even on Christmas, Santa Claus will come there and give us some money. Just enough, two or three dollars to buy you some, some cigarettes or whatever. We had all that going for us. And I really didn't want to leave. If it was some kind of way to stay, I, that I could stay there, I would have stayed. Because I was afraid. I didn't want to come back out. I'm feeling good now. Because when I found out in that letter writing, Satan lied to me, but I found out also my daddy didn't know no better. He did what his daddy did to him. I said, all these years, I hated this man. And he was treated the same way. That freed me. It really freed me. And I went on, and, and when I got in the library, I went to the, I asked the lady where the books, uh, library, uh, resume books was, and she told me the aisle to go down. I went down the aisle, and I was saw the resume book, and on top of there, there was a book called The Cross and the Switchblade. I said, what, you know? And I got the book, and I started flipping it. It was by Nikki Cruz. And I said, wait a minute here. The Lord didn't put this book here for me. And I read that book from front cover to back cover. And when I got in the, uh, the last part of I saw where Nikki uh, had opened up Teen Challenge, him and Bill uh, Wilkerson. And I said, wait a minute. I want to do this. I want to go back and help people. I don't know, but sometimes you better shut your mouth. Because, boy, when I said that, God said, all right, I got you now. I got you now. I went back, and I had this passion. I mean, I had a great passion that, hey, man, I'm on. I, everywhere I went, I was looking for places that I can house me in. I was looking for. It didn't have no money at all. 
going on. I went to work and started working. First time I ever had a job, I kept for three years. I never kept a job for three years. But I was happy on the job. And that's why I had met my, uh, uh, when I had went to start going to church, my pastor told me, let me back up. My pastor told me, he said, boy, he said, with a testimony, this is another pastor now. He said, you need to go to the streets and tell people what God done did for you. So I said, okay. And I formed up a, 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 a ministry called the uh, Mission Team. And we began to start going out into the projects and talking to gang members and all this uh People, we uh, I mean, we were just winning souls like it. I mean, it, it was it was phenomenal. And my wife had, uh, who's my wife now, Kathleen, right here. We are. Uh, she wanted to join the team because she heard about it. So everybody on my team was married, but me. And so when we got out in the field, I had to go and pick her up. And when I picked her up, I kept looking at her, you know, saying. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You know. <laughs> and we got to come talking all praise and stuff. But it, but it, it was still that, you know, uh, I didn't know whether I was going to get married at this time or what. But we kept on communicating. And so we had a guy, and he was a prophet on my team. And one day we came in, and we had been winning souls all that day. And he, he was up, and he was uh, sharing with us about the area that he went in, and he stopped. He stopped in the middle of the conversation, and he looked at me, and he said, y'all, I don't know. He said, but I got to say what I hear the Lord said. He said, uh, Ralph, you and Kathleen need to prepare for marriage. And I fell out of my chair. <laughs> and they, and her mother and all of them, we just, it just exploded in the house. So what we did was said, no, what well, we gonna do? Let's pray. So every day, every night, I would call and we would pray about it. And so one night we went to a we went to a revival, and I knew this lady. She had uh, saw me through the church, and she said uh, she called us from the back. She said, "Ralph, come here." And I got up. She said, "Bring the young lady with you." Called me and Kathleen. Said, "If this is of God, let's get married in February." February the 14th on Valentine's Day, if this is of God. But we was going on and we just kept praying about it. But that night changed our lives. That lady called us up and she looked us up and she said, why not February the 14th? She fell out. Because didn't nobody know that but me and her. And February the 14th, we got married. And we started the journey with God. Uh, going out, still continue going out. And I had went to the Salvation Army. I took 150 men to church and got uh, baptized, every one of them. We started just going off, filling the church up, doing because I have this passion. See, because God gave me this passion to look after those who are just like me. See, just because I'm a pastor, that don't mean that I didn't have a background. See, I got a story to tell that I've been down that road and I know what it is in suffering. It's suffering. It's slavery. Because all night long you walking. This thing got you walking, got you stealing because you don't believe the lie somewhere. And, and we thought that this thing was going to comfort us when it didn't comfort us, it, but it put us in slavery. We had a stronghold, or we have a stronghold that got to be broken. And the only way to be broken is you got to come, you got to renounce it that the devil is a liar, and I can I refuse to live like this anymore. I don't have to have drugs. I don't have to live this way because my God didn't make me to be a failure. He made me to be a person of, of influence, a person who who can uh, 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 can conquer. That's right. I don't have to live this way. We have to. Because whatever the wound is, the world put it on you. But you don't have to live like that. Because you know that there's a devil who has lied to him. Lied. Just run out lie. Because he's the father of lies. 
Yes, he is. So we make these vows. And we have to go to God and we have to renounce all of that stuff. Well, we can live a deeper life. It's no telling how many preachers in here, how many prophets in here, how many evangelists in here, but you'll never get there until you get this mess off of you because it'll keep you back going backwards. It will. And some of this stuff hurt. I know in, in, in the congregation where we are at, some women have been raped. But I say, you got to say something about it. You got to open your mouth and you got to tell on it to get rid of it. And you got to forgive those who have hurt you. Because if you never forgive, you'll never be right. I had to forgive my dad. I had to forgive my mother. My sisters and my brother. I had to forgive all of them. And guess what? And, I, and God used me to go back and tell them the good news and they got saved. Amen. Because I had no reason to be mad with them because they were all up under the influence of Satan. So whoever you've been hurt at you, they are up under the influence of Satan. And we have to forgive them. Yes, it was a bad situation. Yes, they did you wrong. But you got to forgive them. They did Jesus wrong. But what did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's what you have to do. Father, forgive them. I'm going forward now. I'm a Christian. I don't confess Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Now, I don't have to need that on my shoulder. I don't carry enough. And enough is enough, people. I got to let it go. No matter what, because I want to see what the end result's going to be in my life. Who knows? I never even thought I'd be on the 700 Club. That one of the biggest, one of the long lasting uh, 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 Christian stations uh, uh, in the world. I imagine myself, because when you give a story there, you, the story shares in Africa, Asia, everywhere. And I said, just imagine me over in uh, Africa. They got it in uh, uh, Swahili. But you never know where the God wants you to go. But we got to understand the wounds, the lies, the vows, and the stronghold has been set up. It's a stronghold. And I tell you, I had to get broken relationships. All of that stuff started coming in. See, it was just like, I think Elijah throw the axe head in the water. Now, you know how heavy an axe head is, but it floated to the top. See, all of that stuff now should be floating to the top where you can deal with. Because I know standing here today, Somewhere down the road, you have thought about somebody that hurt you. Yeah, it's been exposed. Now it's time to deal with it. Deal with it. Renounce that lie. I have bought a lie. Father, I renounce this lie because I know that I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Yes. We have bought a lie. Now it's done come to the surface and we have to deal with it. So you can go on and, 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 and see what all God has for you. Man, we going on, I tell you what, God has been providing supernatural stuff that I never thought of in my life. The first church, the people told me, they said, uh, uh, if you can fill this church up within a year, we'll give you a dollar. I filled the church up before, uh, that was in December. In March, we had the church filled up. They didn't even come at the dollar. We were so small, we had, we used about, uh, uh, it was about 90, 90 uh, people can sit in the church, and we started having people standing around the wall. And so the thing is, we had to move out of there. So what happened then? So we uh, we met a church that stays, uh, we call it over the mountain. This is a rich place where the wealthy stays. 
and uh, the guy who next door to me, I used to cut his grass too, and he was wondering why I was cutting his grass every time I cut mine. And I just told him I was neighborly. You know, I mean, it wasn't no need of your grass being high in mine. It still looked bad. So I just cut yours. When I planted, when I planted flowers, I planted flowers at his place. And we became, which we are best friends today. And he went back and told his pastor about what we was trying to do over there in that community. And they uh, set up a meeting with us. And we went and uh, sat down and talked with him. And I told Kathleen, another guy was with us, one of the elders I had uh, ministered. And I told him, I said, uh, y'all, let's go. Let's go. There ain't nobody going to help us. Don't nobody care. Really, don't nobody care about drug addicts, alcoholics. Most of the churches you see, they got people in there that's going to pay bills. And we can't pay no bills. So we ain't got no money. So we got to walk by faith and not by sight. Just do what God tells us to do and we'll see the outcome of it. And that's what I did. I got into this faith. I began to start believing God. After that dollar sale, my my uh, my faith went up higher. They brought, they came over, and they became partners with us, and they began to uh, support us. I seen the church uh, over in another area. It was empty, and I was uh, called the lady up to, uh, that had it, real estate lady, and I asked her how much the church was. She said three hundred and fifty some thousand dollars. My faith had went up high, right? It went down. I said, then I said, no. And I remember something. See, when you got rid of all of that baggage of the past, things come to you. You, you got a good memory now. Because a lot of that stuff block out stuff. And I remember Jesus cursing a fig tree. He talked to the tree. And so I went around to the church. I said, if Jesus talked to the tree, I'm going to talk to this bill. I went up on that porch and I said, in the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I said, your name should be called True Vine Evangelical Outreach Ministry. You will house a lot of people and help them in this ministry and walked away. I went out there and I took the sign up and throw it away because it was my church. I called and called around to see who the owners were. And I never could get there. Watch this. I never could get who the owners was. And the guy I had met next door, right? He went to the uh, church, which is Brookwood Baptist Church. He went there. I met his pastor. And as a result of us talking, I told him about this church. And he was the moderator of the Birmingham Baptist Association who owned the church. He said, I'll go over there and talk to him and see what the deal is. He come back and he said, well, they said 300 and some thousand dollars. Uh, could you pay 200 something? I said, we don't have no money. I said, look around you. This is what you get. And so we went on, and I prayed and prayed, and I kept saying I, I wouldn't take down. Because I know the thief. I know he's a liar. I want to go accept anything that he said. I don't care what it is. I accepted what I said to I spoke to that church. So they called me into a meeting, and they said, we had been uh, thinking, Pastor God, we have heard and seen all that you're doing in that neighborhood. And uh, we decided, well, they said that we have a, a church now, have 200 some thousand dollars on the table now. But we don't even much want that. What we'll do is we'll sell you the church for $30,000. And a man was in the corner over there. He was an attorney. He said, and I'll pay the $30,000 for him. And I went and signed the papers on the thing. Amen. 
But I never would have been able to do that or to think right if I had kept all of that baggage in my head and saying, speaking to me, saying, you're a nobody. See, I would have been saying, well, I'm a nobody. I can't do this. But all of that was washed away. My mother passed. She's in. I know she's with the Lord. My sister passed. She's with the Lord. And my brother was dying, and I was sitting in him. I sit with him in the in the room where he was, and led him, the one who knocked me down, who slapped me. He kicked me. But all of that stuff, I had forgiven them, and was able. See, because if somebody in your family need Jesus. And if you open yourself up and let them and, 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 and don't, well, if you don't open yourself up and let them go to hell, it's your fault. But I couldn't sit back and allow this to happen because my eyes was open now. They was wrong, yes, but they didn't know no better. And the thing was, when I went and told them about Jesus, I told him about Jesus when he was dying. The next day he died. My uncle, I was sitting in the pulpit and, and, the Lord told me to get up and go to the Cato, Alabama. I drove all the way to the Cato, Alabama to uh to pray with my uncle because he was a terrible man. But he got born again. All of my family, all of those who did me wrong, they had to then now I was returned to they children. I spoke life into them. My nieces and nephews. Why? Because the wound. And the bruises, they all was taken care of. God brought me out. He brought me out. And I today, I never forget. Wherever he say go, I go. Whatever he say do, I do. And I'm not all the way there. Now, I'm not standing up here saying that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Superman in Christ. No. But day by day, I think about my people. I think about it. I think about that prostitute who's out there on the corner selling her body. I think about that brother. No telling what he's doing to try to get, get high. This lady I saw and I was raised up with. She was a little girl, but I was raised up with. I saw her one Sunday morning. And she was just as dirty, had been out there for days. And I said, Lord, what can this woman go? Today, can she go to our regular church? No, they will run her out of there. But I said, open the door. Open the door for me, and I'll get it. How many ever want to come? And boy, they come in there any kind of way, and we don't care what they smell like, what they look like, and how drunk they are. Because I said, if the Holy Ghost hits you, you're going to get sober. Amen. And I don't seen the Holy Spirit hit a lot of them. Baby, they come in there drunk. They be sober when they walk up out of there. Amen. Ministry just like this. Just like this. And I was glad when I was invited here. Because I can't go nowhere else. And tell, when I go somewhere else and tell my story, they look at me. So, One time I went to a church and they started taking their pocketbooks, putting them up on their arm. <laughs> and I saw it. And me, myself, I, it didn't bother me at all. You know what I told? I said, let me tell y'all something. If I wanted to steal something from you, I'd go in the back of the church and I'd crawl all the way up on them pews and take your stuff from you. That's just how slick and crazy I was. i get you now. That's then, but now, uh-uh. So you can put your pocketbook back down and start laughing. Yes. Amen, because I knew... That if I go in there and tell my story, some of them are going to look at me different. But they never think about the life that they came out of and what they are dealing with now. See, I'm free. And the Bible says, who the son says free, he's free indeed. I am indeed free. I keep joy with me all the time. I got the whole church. When they know when I'm coming, we're going to laugh some. Because they're just like, oh, how free are you? Sometimes I would tell them, I said, uh, I, I sang a little song, a little piece. I don't know the song, the whole song. I said, uh, I feel like uh, I can fly. I believe I can fly. And I do believe that because I'm, I don't have no weight on me, y'all, that keep me down. See, all of that stuff, they'll weigh you down. 
the, the, the wound that hurt us. Because we live in a fallen world. And everybody in this room been hurt by somebody. And it's there. But we have learned how to cover it up until things come there related to that and they come back alive. And that's keeping us from going deeper in Christ Jesus. Yes, it keeps us from going deeper. So I believe, and I've been saying to our church that we fit to go to battle. Because I remember this here in the United States Army, when I came first got in there, I get went through the process of uh, getting your uniforms and all this stuff. But right after that, they put you out there and teach you warfare. The church need to be taught warfare because there's a lot of people hurting and don't know why. I'm in church. I love the Lord. I go every Sunday. Why does this keep bothering me? Why does this stuff keep coming back? Because it's the wounds, the lies that they're saying I'm told. And you got to get rid of it. Because he's a, the scripture said, he's a liar and the father of lies. That's his character. And if you've been told a lie, look in the Bible. And if that lie is in the Bible, that's you then. But it ain't in there. Whatever the Bible says, that's who you are. Amen. I hope I have said something today and may have hurt, helped somebody. Last night I prayed, I said, Lord, if I can't help a one, let that one be so. I be on did what you wanted me to do. Because I love coming and telling his story of what he done for me. And then find out this here, what I found out about the wounds that had me so messed up. I'm talking about really, y'all, messed up. And I thought, I thought the heroin was my buddy. I, he took, the heroin took all the pain away. But guess what? Didn't really take it away. It was there. The next day I had to do it. The next day I had to do it. And I had to do it for 25 years, walking the streets of Birmingham, had a good family, but then nobody want me. Now here I am out there on the streets, going to the soup kitchen. Leave the soup kitchen and go get drunk some more. Because this stuff was on me. All of my childhood life, I'm trying to be somebody. But when I met the master, the savior, he made me who I supposed to be. Yes, you supposed to be what he made you to be. Amen. Yes. He brought me all this way. 25 more years now. Been married 26 years, eh? 27 years. <laughs> That's why I got married on, four, on uh, Valentine's Day, so I went forgetting that. <laughs> but I see him. 27 years, in ministry 25 years, and got 11 grandchildren. And then when we started out, it wasn't nobody but me and her and our stepson, my stepson. Which I don't call him stepson, I call him son. And the two that I said that was uh the three that I had mistreated. And God brought all of them together. Now I'm a proud father. My children call he makes my oldest son and daughter. They call me for instruction. Ain't that something? When I was a nobody, God made me somebody. And that's what he want to do in each of our lives. Just, 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 not my will, but let your will be done. I'm tired of trying to run this life. You run it for me. And sometimes every now and then you'll get over in there 
You, you'll get over there trying to do it yourself, but then you'll get right back in your right place. So I just want to thank God for you all allowing me to be here uh, today, me and my wife, and uh, we enjoy doing what we do. I tell you, we do. I, I said a lot of times that uh, it was a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice to get where we were because both of us, we we were so into what the Lord had called us to do. We had no time for ourselves. And I remember one time we went out and it was Thanksgiving. We were buying everybody groceries and forgot we had needed groceries for Thanksgiving dinner. And we didn't have Thanksgiving because everybody else was. We would go in the crack houses, well, the crack babies and see them. And they'd be running around the floor crying and just shaking. And we go get pampers and food for them and come back. The lady, she doing whatever she got to do. She'd lock us out till she get through. We'd wait out there in the car and take food in there. Until then. That just was the passion we have, the passion that we have. Again, thank you all for allowing me to be here. And Pastor, thank you so much. Pastor Mike, when I saw his testimony, I said, oh, man, I'm not going into a religious house. I'm going in where people uh, receive me like I receive him. Because some places, man, you have a hard time trying to preach. You know, and I know I ain't have to come here and preach. All I had to do was come here and just share what God had done for me and what the things that I have got through revelation knowledge, through the wounds, brute lies, vows, and uh and stronghold. W L V S radio station of the demons. It's a demon radio station. All right, thank you all. Amen. God bless you. <laughs>